Okay, everyone. Once you've learned, and I presume you will have done that in class, how to add vectors tip to tail, and then how to do a solution of unknown vectors in a concurrent force problem, you want to eventually get to a point where you can see and do it algebraically just as fast as you can if you are doing a solution of a graphic solution. So I'm going to go through very quickly how the graphic solution works. I'm going to try to do it with a straight edge if I can. The straight edge, the solution will look something like this, and it's going to be a graphic solution, which means in a graphic solution, I'm going to try to bring this back up again. Okay, in a graphic solution, you really don't have to worry too much about scale. All right, so there's a member there, and in it, we'll talk about then how we worry about this having a reactive direction. Let's see if we can go to there. So this has a pin joint there, so it has a line of force of reaction there. And this has a roller joint. I'm sorry, this has a roller joint here. And this has a pin joint. So you do not know its moment of reaction there. And then you perhaps have a force that looks something. Let's see if I can do that. I'll do an edit undo. You'll have a force that looks something like that. Now, remember the steps, and I won't go them through them all here. That force is pushing there, which means in the end, you want to go through this process of what? Hanging all of the forces. See, best I can do. Right? Hang all those forces off their tails at their point of application. So that is no longer there. Let's see if we can use the, we'll just use the, drop tool there. We'll get rid of that and leave that around. So that's the force. And how? here's what you now know. In any system that is a three-force system that is under static equilibrium, you know that the line of force of all three of the forces must be concurrent. Get that in your heads and it makes a lot of solutions pretty useful. So now you realize that that is your point of concurren concurrency. And so now once again you can go through the process of how to solve a three-force system when you know one force and direction, another direction and another direction. The only thing you're left with are forces here and forces there. You know their directions. And so you go about that. I'm going to switch colors now. You're going to go ahead now and just once again now instead of sliding that force so its point of concurrency or point of application is there, you just slide it till you get to that point, and that was your applied force, right? You know that the sum of the forces have to be equal to zero. So the applied force plus some forces along this axis, I'm going to talk about that one there, plus another force along that axis has to equal to zero. So you go from here to here, you pick a direction home that way, and what you're going to do is you're just going to learn to offset that direction there. So this force here, I'll go ahead and see if I can put that in red, that force there essentially is the reaction force there and this force, we'll do this in purple, this force here is the reaction force there. And so you end up realizing that it, for sure, any x component in there has to be reacted by an equal and opposite x component there because it is only the pin joint that has that reaction. So that's how uh, we go about solving it. Once again, you lay out your system, you replace each reaction with a line of force if it is known. You slide your forces and simplify all of your forces to one resultant slide that resultant so it hangs from its tail. Look for the point of concurrency between your two known directions of force and your other known direction and magnitude. Call that your zero point. Slide your known, your, your resultant of known vectors so it hangs from that point 
and then go back to zero along two directions as determined by your lines of force for each of your reactions. So we'll be going through that quickly and numerically. Let's see how this then looks in a, uh, a similar problem, though it won't be exactly the same. So I'm going to go through and do file new and no. And now we're getting back now the basic problem, which you'll see that one we just did eventually um, crystallizes down to, and that is this. You have a concurrent force problem here. Force one is a known unknown direction, an, uh, a known direction, unknown magnitude. Force two is a known direction, unknown magnitude. And force three is known direction and known magnitude. So in other words, this is known this is known direction. And that direction is going to be always, hopefully, measured from your assumed x-axis, your standard position angle. So we're going to call that direction theta 1. Force 2, you just have to realize force 2 has to be measured again off the standard position angle when you talk about the standard position angle. And even now, force 3 either has to be measured positively or negative from the same standard position angle. This is the step that you need to make now. You need to pick a standard position angle and then always measure your directions off of that. That standard position angle will be the x and it will be the xy plane for the third when you go to the third dimension. And so you now can remember by rote or by unit circle that the F in the X direction is equal to the magnitude of the force times the cosine of the direction and the F in the Y direction is the magnitude of the force times the sine of the direction. And you can remember that in fact a concurrent force problem the forces have no moments, and so all you're left with is a sum of the forces in the x equals zero, and the sum of the forces in the y equals zero. And so you historically would have written, written this, well, the cosine of theta one times the force one plus force two times the cosine of theta 2 plus force 3 times the cosine of theta 3 all equals 0. And you would have written force 1 times the sine of theta 1 plus force 2 times the sine of theta 2 plus force 3 times the sine of theta 3 all equals zero and you would have gone through a bunch of math and did solutions and whatever else realizing that in a problem like this these are known quantities because you know both the angle and that. Lots of different ways to go about doing this but the preferred and probably at this point I would say the only solution you should be doing is this. You should be writing a matrix Right? And that matrix will have in here the description of the unit vector of force 1. So this is going to be lambda of force 1. This is going to be lambda of force 2 times your unknowns, which is magnitude of force 1 and force 2. equals the opposite, if you would, by taking this to the side of the known. So in this case, this is going to be the opposite of the knowns. 
and that'll look like that with two values here and there. What in fact is the unit vector? It is written something i and something j and what is that? It is the cosine of theta 1 i and the sine of theta 1 i. And what is a lambda or the unit vector describing f2? It is the cosine of theta 2 and the sine of theta 2. You're getting this habit right now so that when you get to three forces and three or, 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 or three dimensions where you've got three unknown forces that you can do the solution just as quickly because your unit vector there will be have an x, a y, and a z component. It will look exactly the same. So remember you go back to the history or the knowledge that in this case you have no moments, therefore all you have is two equations and two unknowns. You write it like this, but then you quickly learn to go to the matrix equation, which is this is the first column, and the column vector is a description of the direction of force one. The column, the second column is the direction of force two. And across the equal side, you've got essentially the opposite of the magnitude of the knowns because it had to come to the other side. And when you then multiply both sides by the inverse of this matrix, you get the solution for the unknown forces. Now, this may be a bit of a leap. It shouldn't be, however, when you start realizing that in fact, that's why you want to learn to very quickly to start to express all of your vectors if you can by the magnitude of the vector times the unit vector which is a vector of length one that describes the direction of the vector. Lambda you will eventually see is going to be done by stripping out the z and then stripping the projected vector or the xy plane vector into x's and y's and we'll do that by rote uh, at the next video. You should be able to do this very very quickly first and foremost by sliding vectors but just as quickly in a calculator or any other engine by doing the matrix calculations using the inverse calculation and then checking that your graphic solution is about the same as your matrix solution. Solution. All right. So we'll talk about this. We'll post this out and do some examples next. But that sense of being able to do problems like this in the five to 10 minute at the outside, five to 10 minute per problem should not be an issue. It is all predicated on, however, sticking a sta uh, measuring a standard position angle and always measuring your angles off of that, either positively or negatively. Thanks for listening.